Humans are the most conscious animal. In other words, there is such a thing as a sentience hierarchy, and humans are at the top. Some say that humans' position at the top of the sentience hierarchy gives us the right to oppress and exploit other animals, while others would say that our position in the hierarchy and our ability to make moral choices means we have the responsibility to protect those who are lesser. Both sides tend to assume that there is such a thing as a sentience hierarchy, and that it can be said that some beings are more conscious than others. But what is actually meant by the concept of a sentience hierarchy? What does it mean to say that one being is more conscious than another? It's clear that variations in sentience do exist. The experience of a honeybee is going to differ vastly from that of an elephant or an octopus. It's also clear that sentience is extremely complex, and variations in sentience are unlikely to be adequately captured by a single dimension. If we try to fit every sentient being onto a single scale, we have a theory which lacks nuance and which suggests a simple reality, even when that couldn't be farther from the case. In this video, I'm going to be presenting a paper called The Dimensions of Animal Consciousness, which you can access here on Cell. I'm not a cognitive scientist, so I recommend reading the paper for yourself if you think I'm misinterpreting anything. This paper was published in 2020 into a field that is relatively new, so it's important to note that the paper is a proposal for how to begin the process of categorizing consciousness into distinct dimensions. It's not a theory in the scientific sense of something that has been proven and accepted by most scientists. The authors begin by establishing that other animals are, in fact, sentient, and that the current tendency is to think that we occupy different levels of consciousness. To quote from the paper, we could attempt to construct a single sliding scale of animal consciousness, along which birds, fish, cephalopods, bees, and so on could all be placed. This, however, would be a mistake. The main concern is that if we try to force states of consciousness into a one or two dimensional scale, we will inevitably neglect important dimensions of variation. If we ask the question, is a human more conscious than an octopus, the question barely makes sense. For this reason, we suggest that animal consciousness research should adopt a multi-dimensional approach, not a single-scale approach, when thinking about variation across the animal kingdom. They then go on to propose five dimensions in their framework. They are perceptual richness, evaluative richness, integration at a time, integration across time, and selfhood. For the rest of this video, we'll explore each dimension at a time, starting with perceptual richness. Perceptual richness refers to the variation in the level of detail with which animals consciously perceive aspects of their environments. Animals that make fine-grained conscious discriminations in a particular sense, like vision or hearing, can be said to have p-rich experiences in that modality. There is no overall measure of p-richness, rather, every animal has a separate measure of richness for each sense. For each measure of richness, we can break the variation down into three components, bandwidth, resolution, and categorization power. Bandwidth refers to the total range of information experienced at a given time, whereas resolution refers to the smallest bit of information that is distinguishable from the rest. Categorization power refers to the ability of an animal to convert all that perceptual information into high-level categories. It's not enough to see things, you need a way to process that sense data and pick apart the important signals. An example of high categorization power would be the ability to read faces and body language from members of similar species. We can convert small differences in input to a large array of meaning by recognizing patterns and categorizing them. An example of low categorization power can be shown by taking a look at this image and seeing how many objects you can identify. The bandwidth and resolution of your senses are intaking rich information, but it does not result in anything you can understand or categorize. Vision is probably the easiest sense to put into this framework, so try and imagine what it means to have bandwidth, resolution, and categorization power in other senses like hearing or smell. What would it be like to be an elephant or dolphin and be hearing sounds from kilometers away? or to be a bear and smell things from kilometers away. When people assert that humans are more sentient than other animals, they often assume that this means that humans can experience more suffering than other animals. But how likely is this to be the case when the perceptive abilities of animals just outclass ours in many ways? We need a separate dimension to compare the ability of organisms to experience pleasure and suffering, which brings us to our next dimension, evaluative richness. Evaluative richness refers to the ability of organisms to experience positive or negative valence. 
Valence refers to experiences which have the subjective quality of bad or good. Stubbing your toe feels bad, whereas receiving affection feels good. Valence provides an evaluative common currency for use in affect-based decision-making. It may not always work to attribute human emotions like sorrow or rage onto certain species, but wherever conscious feeling or affect is used to make decisions, valence must apply. Evaluative decision-making occurs when these conscious affects are weighted against each other. For example, rats who were offered the opportunity to walk into a cold chamber to access sugar chose to do so. They weighed the positive valence of the sugar against the negative valence of the cold and determined it was worth it. This implies cross-modal integration of information, which has been linked to consciousness but may not be necessary for it. Like P-richness, E-richness also can have bandwidth and resolution. Rich, affect-based decision-making takes many inputs into account at once, that's bandwidth, and is sensitive to small differences in those inputs, that's resolution. Some animals may be constantly evaluating small changes in their internal states and external surroundings, as we do, whereas others may respond only to more substantial changes. There are even more ways we can break down evaluative richness. I found a paper here which presents three dimensions of emotional variation, valence, persistence, and intensity, as well as a lot of interesting research on affect-based consciousness, so check that out if you're interested. The next dimension of animal consciousness is integration at a time, or unity. Unity is a bit more difficult to understand than our first two dimensions, partly because it's something that we as humans tend to take for granted. We experience the world through a unified perspective. Each of us is one individual who is subject to all the experiences generated by our brains. This unity can break down in instances of split brain syndrome. Subjects who have had the corpus callosum wholly or partially severed sometimes display disunified behavior when different stimuli are presented to the two halves of the visual field. If these subjects are asked to verbally describe what they see, they will report what is visible on the right-hand side of their visual field. This is because language is predominantly controlled by the brain's left hemisphere, which only has access to visual information from the right-hand side. Yet, when asked to draw with the left hand what they see, they will draw what is visible on the left-hand side of the visual field. This is because the left hand is predominantly controlled by the right hemisphere, which only has access to visual information from the left-hand side. This disunity of behavior leads to a debate about whether experience itself is also disunified. Could there be two subjects within one skull? When we look at other species, this becomes even more interesting because many of them, like birds, lack the connective tissue between brain hemispheres and are naturally split brains. The authors ask the question, could every bird be a pair of conscious subjects, intimately cooperating with the other? The same goes for octopuses who have a degree of functional independence between the brains and their arms. Could an octopus have two or even nine conscious perspectives on the world? Current evidence does not settle these questions. Our aim is only to raise them. Variations in unity seem to mess with our perception of what consciousness even is. Does it even make sense to ask what an individual octopus is experiencing? How do we even begin to comprehend what low unity consciousness is like while being high unity ourselves? This dimension presents a significant challenge to research because it is much harder to understand without unified subjective reporting. The next dimension is integration across time, or temporality. Similar to unity, temporality is something we are quite familiar with as humans. Instead of experiencing each moment independently, we experience reality as if time is moving forward through moments. We have experiences that integrate information across many different moments in time. We are not stuck in a single moment. We can experience future moments through imagination and predictions, and we can experience past moments through memory. This is temporality. The paper briefly discusses evidence of this characteristic in corvids and a few other groups of species, with the main takeaway being the open question of how we would go about conducting experiments that could tell us more about the experience of temporality in other animals. This is an interesting dimension because it's easier to imagine what high or low temporality would be like to experience. When someone has a brain injury or is taking a medication that decreases their short-term memory, there is less integration of information across time. Each moment of experience is integrated with fewer memories from the past and less foresight into the future. On the other hand, someone who had a cybernetic implant allowing them to store their memories indefinitely and allowed them to experience any of them at any given time would have incredible temporality. They wouldn't be limited to a single moment like we are. 
they can integrate information from any memory or any imagination at will. Let me know in the comments, if you could change yourself along any one of these dimensions, which one would you go for? I would definitely go for temporality. The final dimension of animal consciousness is selfhood. Selfhood is the awareness of oneself as a separate thing from the outside world. The paper discusses a few possible variations in this dimension. First, a minimal awareness of selfhood is necessary to some degree for any complex mobile animal, as we need ways to disentangle changes to our sensory inputs that are due to our own movements and the events in the world. Going further, an increase in selfhood leads to more awareness of one's body as a persistent object that exists in the world. Some species of animals have passed the mirror mark test. They are able to recognize themselves in mirrors and react to marks placed on their body seen through the mirror. This suggests an awareness of the self as an object in the world, which is a form of self-consciousness. Though the mirror test has been criticized as it only really captures self-consciousness along a limited anthropocentric focus. Species who don't rely on their vision may not respond to visual images of themselves, but may be able to recognize their own scents or sounds. Other species, like gorillas, may fail the mirror test because the image of another ape triggers an aggressive reaction. Clearly, this is a dimension which is difficult to measure, as it's hard to design experiments that don't rely on our anthropocentric conception of selfhood. Another gradient in selfhood occurs when a mind has an awareness of itself as a persisting stream of experiences, distinct from the subjective experiences of others. This is known as a theory of mind. Other beings are not just features of the world, they have conscious experiences too, and while we can't directly access them, a theory of mind allows us to ascribe mental states to others. This isn't something that humans start out with. Until about five years old, most children do not have the capacity to understand that other people are experiencing different things, that they do not have access to the same information that they do. While some animals definitely possess this ability to some degree, there is very little evidence of a theory of mind in non-human animals comparable to our own. So those are the five dimensions of consciousness proposed by this paper. I didn't go into any of the discussion on experimental design, so if you're interested in that, make sure to give it a read. It also has more information on how specific groups of species like birds and cephalopods actually rank on these scales. One concern I do have for this type of research is that, despite being focused on the conscious experience of animals, we do still live in a world where animals exploited for research purposes are treated pretty horribly. For example, the paper lists induced blind sight as one of the experimental paradigms for testing perceptive richness. This involves making a lesion somewhere on the brain of an animal. As far as I'm aware, this isn't reversible, and it definitely isn't respectful to the intrinsic value of animals to treat them like disposable objects, especially if it's for knowledge that we could have done without. Moving forward, I hope that animal consciousness and scientific research in general can find ways to advance our knowledge without invasive, non-consensual practices, which is one more reason why animal rights is so important. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe for more content on sustainability, futurism, and animal rights. And let me know in the comments, what is your favorite species of animals and how do they rank on these dimensions?